I want to share with you the message this morning that's very personal to me. It's not only a message from the Word of God, but it's something that I believe and I practice. I've instilled in my own family, students that I've had over the years. When I was a, a coach, my athletes would hear me speak and vocalize something very similar to what this message is. So if you will apply what we are going to hear in this next 30 minutes or so, it will change your life, I promise you, because it comes solely from the Word of God. Now, I'm going to start in Numbers chapter 13 and 14. You don't need to turn there. I'm just going to remind you of a story. Um, the Lord spoke to Moses and told Moses to send out men from each tribe, each of the 12 tribes, into the promised land, the Canaan land that God had promised to give to the children of Israel and to look at the land because they were promised the land. It was given to them almost a thousand years earlier by Abraham, but because of sin and disobedience, they wandered off and became in bondage in Egypt. They've been set free from Egypt, and God is trying to return them back to the promised land. And so Moses met with the leaders of uh, the 12 tribes, and they found scouts from each of the 12 tribes, and they sent these men over to search out the land. They were there for 40 days. And it's interesting because when they came back after 40 days, they came back with a different report. Ten of them said, the land is wonderful, it's a good land, it's, it's flowing with uh, vegetation, but there are strong walls and there are many people and the people are big. And they said this, we are not able to take this land. Two of the people that returned from the 12 gave a different report. Much of what they said was the same. It's a wonderful land. It's a good land. It's flowing with, with, with abundance of fruit and vegetation. There are strong walls and many people, but we are able, because God has given us this land, we are able to possess it. It's interesting because the same people, they saw the same thing. But they saw it from a different perspective. It's much like us in our lives. Many of us see situations and we see them from a position of faith. Others of us see a situation and we begin to worry and stress and, and uh, allow fret and doubt to come into our minds. And we believe that we are not able to do something just because our perspective or our vantage point is a little bit skewed by the reality of the circumstances that we're facing. You see, the children of Israel, these people had already seen the Red Sea parted. They had walked over onto dry ground from Egypt out of bondage. They had seen Marian healed of leprosy. They had seen already manna fall from heaven. They had seen many miracles of God. And yet they came to this place and these 10 out of the 12 spies saw this land and said, we can't do that. We're not able to because they were not focusing on God and God's promise. Remember, it was called the promised land. And what God says, he means. They were going there. But something very sad takes place in this story. These 10 spies that said they couldn't, they limited their ability to be used by God and to be blessed by God. They saw the same thing as the other two scouts. And the word of God says this, God declares to them, because these men who have seen my glory and my miracles, which I did for them in Egypt and the wilderness, and have not listened to my voice, they shall not see the land. Wow. Now, they were still God's people. God still loved them. And I want you to apply this to your own life, to circumstances that you may face. When God's speaking to you about a, a situation, God still loved them. They were still fed manna from heaven in the wilderness. Their shoes didn't wear out for the next 40 years in the wilderness. But God said, okay, you don't believe it, so it's not going to happen. Now think about the power of our words in faith and realize what just happened to these people. God said, because you have seen my miracles in the wilderness and in Egypt, you know what I can do. I've promised you this land, but because you said you can't, you will not go. God was still with them. He still protected them. He still loved them. You see, there are over 5,000 promises in the Word of God, promises for God's people, promises to us because God, because God loves us. And yet, if we don't have the faith to receive what God has given to us, we will limit the blessings of, of God that are on our life. What I want you to know from this is, most importantly, 10 people said they couldn't go to the land, and the fact is they never did. 
to Joshua and Caleb, the scripture says this, God declared to them, but Joshua and Caleb and their seeds shall possess the land. Forty years later, Joshua fought the battle of Jericho in the promised land. And you know the story, and the walls came tumbling down. Ten said they couldn't, they said they couldn't, and they didn't. Two said they could, and they did. Wow, what an idea, what a, what a concept to realize. You see, we often talk about faith. It's a popular conversation in, in preaching. And I, I have to tell you, Ted, Pastor Ted and I were right on. I didn't tell him what the message was, and I didn't know what songs he was picking. But I believe, I believe in the God of miracles is what this message is all about. We can talk about faith, but the Bible tells us to walk by faith. To believe that God is able, not to, just for our circumstances, it's just to walk by faith and not by sight. When God promises us something, it is sure, and you can believe it and trust in it. You shall have what you say. Do you realize that God spoke the world into existence? He spoke it. He just said it. Do you know the scripture tells us that life and death is in the power what, of the tongue. Wow, God promises us and provides for us a way and a plan, and yet God wants us to believe and then to act on that belief by professing and confessing and believing and trusting God for what he says will happen. Now, I'm a school teacher, so I deal with children all the time who say they can't. You know, they look at mathematics, they're in the second grade and they're looking at fractions and say, I can't do that. We know in education that children will rise to the level of our expectations. That we know that if they don't believe they can, they never will. So part of what we do is try to convince them that they are smart, they're capable, that they can do this, if they will put their effort into it, it will make sense to them very shortly. Now, for some people, math never did make much sense. And I'm kind of in that category. I, I, I passed and I got through it and for those of you that haven't been around math for a long time, they're now teaching algebra in the third grade. Yeah, dividing and multiplying letters instead of things. I, I never really could understand or comprehend that myself, but many of us have these ideas. Well, you know, I'm, I'm stubborn because I'm German, or I'm, I, I have anger issues because I'm Irish. We have these false stereotypes in our lives. And we end up having a self-fulfilling prophecy. We live a certain way because we think that we're supposed to because someone told us something that wasn't true. And so we behave in a certain way based on those preconceived ideas that are actually false. Listen, your behavior is learned and it can be corrected. And if you've learned some bad habits or you're doing something, if you said, I had a college student walk into my class, this has been a couple of years ago and we had a, a, a little uh, confrontation right from the very first day. He came into my class and he was laughing to his peers and to me in, in the beginning of class. He says, yeah, I'm a procrastinator. I'm going to turn everything in late. And I said, well, then why don't you just drop the class right now? Because if it's a minute late, it's an F. And you're not going to pass this class if you turn things in late. And he quit laughing for the, fun, for the strangest reason. It wasn't funny anymore. You see, he had convinced himself that he was a procrastinator. That's who he is. He defined himself by that, and therefore he fulfilled his own prophecy by turning things in late. That kid got an A in my class because we changed his behavior from day one. Either you do it the right way or you might as well just drop the class now because you're not going to make it through. All right? Now, it's kind of a crazy idea, you know, an example maybe, uh, but students will rise to the level of our expectation just as our children will and so we instill in them good things um, you know it's like we inherit blue eyes and dimples from our parents but you can't blame your parents for your bad attitude None of, and as adults we can't blame it on our ethnic heritage and our, and our background you remember the movie The Help there was a great movie that was out a few years ago it was about a wealthy white families in the south who it probably took place maybe in the 50's and there were black servants, maids, butlers, nannies that were taking care of the families and taking care of the children in particular. And there was a scene in that movie where the black nanny was talking to this young girl who she was raising because her parents were wealthy and much too busy for their children, of course. And this, this nanny would tell her every day, 
and I forget the little girl's name. She was one of the main characters, and so was the nanny. She said, you just remember with that accent, what I, what I, tell, to, what I tell you, or whatever, you know, however they said it. She said, you is a smart, you is a kind, and you is important. She said it with that nice southern accent. And the next day, in, in the play, they didn't show this every day, this scene every day, but she would instill it into her constantly, letting her know that she was important and she was smart and she was capable. Well, the nanny was going to get fired for a very funny reason if you watched the movie. Okay, the funny reason took place. She was going to be fired. Her last day with this little girl, she met with her one more time, and she said, you know, of all the things I've taught you, I just want you to remember one thing. And she called her by name, Liza or something. You never forget this that you is smart, that you is kind, and you is important. Listen, as a person thinks in their heart, so is he, so are we. We must believe first and then act on that belief by faith, trusting that God's word is true. You know, I, I, I can't stand negative people. I can't stand to be around them. People sometimes will ask me in the back when I'm getting here, say, hey, how you doing? Good. At least good. My bad days are good. My good days are great. And some days I'm fantastic. You've heard me, several of you have heard me say, it's like Tony the Tiger. I'm great. Because that's the way I, the Bible says, this is a day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. So your worst days should be good days. Listen, you're here. That means you're mobile. You can hear me and see me. That should be something. That means your senses are working well. This is a good day. Any day on this side of glory is a good day, and when we get to glory, we'll celebrate with him. Amen? All right. So I try to avoid negative people. I just don't want to be around them. There was one teacher I used to teach with. When I would see her, I'd, I'd open the teacher's lounge and start to go in for lunch, and if she was in there, I'd just shut the door and walk away. Many other people did the same thing. You've, you know people like this. We all work with them or go to school with them and we, we meet them. I'd see her coming down the hallway and I'd turn and, and go into a closet or something. I'd rather stand in a dark closet than run across her in the hallway because she was going to rain on my parade. She was so miserable in her life that I just didn't want to be around her. I, I don't like negative, right? I don't like to hear the negative, to complain, to be cynical. I get up in the morning, I don't look so good. I walk in the bathroom, look in the mirror, and it says back to me, you is ugly. <laughs> Just like that nanny. So I turn the light out and shave in the dark. No, I don't really do that. <laughs> and it, it's interesting, I'm taking yoga classes at the Y now. I'm 65 on Medicare, so I get free Y membership. So I've been taking this yoga class. And no, Ryan, I don't wear yoga pants, all right? Just get that image out of your mind. But in the yoga class, they have mirrors. And so you're in, this, in there with this little mat and you're sitting on it and doing all these pretzel maneuvers. I, I, you know, folks, this is not a yoga body, all right? I am not a new sports car. This is an old Buick up here, all right? That's, that's kind of where I'm at. And uh, these mirrors are everywhere, no matter where you face. I don't want, I'm not inspired when I look at myself, right? I'm hoping for something better. I'm believing for something better. That's why I'm in this class. I have to tell you, the first day of yoga, I fell asleep. <laughs> they had us sitting in a chair, holding our legs kind of out in front of us, crossing our arms in front of us. They said, now put your chin to your chest and breathe deeply. That's my napping position. I, I was gone. It was all over. And I wasn't sure as we went through the rest, of, that was in the beginning of the class, that was kind of getting us in the mood for yoga or something. And I wasn't sure if I fell asleep, but I thought I did. So at the end, I said to the lady next to me, I think I fell asleep. And she said, oh, yes, you did. <laughs> so anyway, we don't want to have bad days. I used to sing at school all the time. I'd walk down the hallways and sing because... I was just a cheerful, happy person. And you know what? We infect other people. We affect other people by who we are, either in a good way or a bad way. You know, you can have negative faith. You can have faith for the right thing and for the good thing. And you can also have negative faith and be a doubter 
and not believe that something is going to happen. You can believe that it's not going to happen more than others believe that it's going to happen. So one of the, one of the things that I have just, that I apply to my life is never vocalize doubt. Do not. I know it's bouncing around in your head. You're thinking, man, I can never do this. This is impossible. Don't say it. Do not vocalize doubt because you will have what you say. That's what the Bible tells us. And you don't want to vocalize negative faith. And when we have, we're, we're confronted with this, this idea about I can't, you just need to believe that the Bible says that we can do all things through Christ. That it is possible. There's another story, uh, let's see, Mark chapter 11 in the Bible, where Jesus and the disciples are walking together. They come to a fig tree, they're hungry. They come up to the fig tree, and when they get there, they, know, they notice that there's no fruit on it, that it's nothing but leaves. There's the message in itself. Nothing but leaves blowing in the wind, getting attention, but when people get closer, they see no fruit. Well, Jesus, because the tree was in season and bore no fruit, Jesus cursed the tree. That was one day. The next day, when they, came, when they woke up and they traveled again, they came to the same place in the road, and Peter said to Jesus, Master, look, the tree that you cursed is withered. Like he was surprised, right? I mean, that's the way. It doesn't say he was surprised, but why would he tell Jesus that the tree that he cursed is withered? It's like Jesus says, well, duh, of course it is. I cursed it. It's gone. It's dead from the root. It is not going to live anymore. And Jesus looks at him, looks at Peter, who, who brought this to his attention, and he says, have faith in God. Have faith in God. Believe. Remember that song? There was a song that we, I started thinking about it when they were singing this miracle song during uh, the worship service to anticipate the inevitable supernatural intervention of God I expect a miracle did you guys ever sing that in Sunday school I expect no I'll sing it to you again if you want me to. yeah maybe I won't my wife always tells me to quit singing and since she's sitting here I you know I'll, I'll stop but that was a great song I expect a miracle a supernatural intervention of God that's what a miracle is why do we doubt when God does things? We say, wow, I can't believe That's amazing. Why is that amazing? If it's a promise from the word of God that a, that a person who has, who has been selfish and greedy and immoral can come to the Lord and be forgiven, why are we amazed when God forgives them? We should expect a miracle. We should expect it. In the presence of God, when we're talking about the promises of God, we should expect a miracle. Jesus said to Peter, have faith in God, man. What are you thinking about? And then he gave a lesson for Peter and the disciples, all of them together. He said, if you speak to this tree, whosoever shall say to this mountain, rather, not to the tree, whosoever shall say to this mountain, be removed and cast into the sea and shall not doubt, but believe that whatsoever he says shall come to pass, you shall have whatsoever you say he took them to school he wanted them to understand this isn't just about a fig tree and the mountain it represents problems in our lives things that we're circumstances that we're in um, the, the kinds of things that we all struggle with I mean it's whether it's a, a medical physical condition or it's a financial situation or it's people at work or neighbors or people in the family that are that are struggling with one another we have life is not easy no one's going to try to sugarcoat that and tell you that it's going to just be easy and you don't have to worry about anything, everything will be taken care of. No, but God does promise us things. He promises to be with us. He promises to take care of us. He promises to give us peace in adversity to give us peace. When difficult times come, true believers draw closer to God. And false believers begin to blame God. Now, honestly, we've all been to a positions in our time in our life where we thought God where are you like I don't understand and there are, and there are times like that in our life when we need faith more than ever when we need to trust in the Lord and go to the Lord and pray and believe amen and ask God to help us with what we are struggling with I have a, my own little never again list I don't have it written down but 
in my head anyway, never again will I say, I can't, because I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. Never again will I say something is impossible, because the Bible says that with God all things are possible. And yet, yet there are people that live in impossible. They live, they're, they're defined by hopelessness. Why do we do that to ourselves? Especially as believers. Why do we fall into the land of hopelessness and impossibilities when we serve an almighty God? Hallelujah. Never again will I say I'm weak because greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. Never again will I say, and you can go on and on and make up your own, that I'm afraid because God has not given me the spirit of fear. Right? So we, shouldn't, we should not be struggling with these things. One of them that many people struggle with, and I have at times, we all have at times, I'm sure, is feeling like we're nothing. Feeling like we're not important, that we're not valued, that we're, that we're worthless. And that can be devastating. That can be heart-wrenching, and it can destroy you. Listen, don't, don't be defined by your failures. Don't be defined by your weakest moments in your life. The Bible says... You are not a mistake. You were created in the image of God. And when you, when you look at the scriptures on creation, the Bible says that we were not only created in the image of God, but that you were wonderfully made. You are precious in his sight. And marvelous is God's creation. So you're precious and wonderful and marvelous. That's what the Bible says. And if you believe anything else, you have negative faith. That doesn't mean we have to float around all arrogant and puffed up about ourselves. I don't think that's the problem. The problem is the enemy speaks to us and people bully us and say things to us. And, and maybe we have a, a disappointment, a failure, a, a loss in our life. You know, that's life. But then the enemy comes and said, see, I told you you're nothing, you're nobody, you're never going to amount to anything, you're going to fail in life. And all of a sudden we start believing that kind of stuff. You shall have what you say. Do not say you are nothing. Do not say I'm not important. Don't believe the lie. You are precious in the sight of God. Jesus said, I have plans for you, plans to prosper you and to give you hope and a future. That's what the Bible says. So when you're feeling down, you need to get your head in the Word. You need to remember some, some Bible scriptures. Make your own I can't list. When you're struggling, there was, there was someone that I counseled with just recently and, and was praying with them about some challenges that they had in their life. And I gave them a scripture and said, every time this reoccurs in your life, this temptation happens, turn to the scriptures and read this. You need to memorize the scripture, I told her. And, and I hope that she did. That was the advice that I would give to someone who's struggling. And that's what we do in biblical counseling. We direct people back to the Word for strength because the Word endures forever. Heaven and earth and our problems shall pass away. It'll all be in the rearview mirror, but we will get lost in the present if we fall prey to hopelessness. And so we go back to the Word of God and we read it. There's actually a couple of words in the New Testament used for the word word. That is, logos is mentioned some 200 times in the Word of God in the New Testament alone, talking about words. And words, logos words are not bad. It's like facts and information and, and details and instructions. And our, but here's, here's the thing. Our life is full of logos. From talk radio, entertainment, news, sports, and the like. Talking, a couple of guys talking about the browns in the back is logos, all right? There's no rhema in those words. Rhema is anointed, living, inspired words. And that is mentioned in the New Testament only a handful of times. And so what we need to do is replace all the logos in our life with rhema. Rhema means inspired word. Jesus said the words rhema that I speak to you, they are spirit and they are life. The words of Jesus are spirit and life. What did Jesus say? Believe, cast the mountain into the yonder uh, ocean. If you believe it and say it, it will happen. And we're not talking about winning the lottery. Don't be silly, right? If anybody's made, oh, good. Uh-huh, it's almost up to a billion. Well, they already split that one. We already missed out on that one. 
the next lottery will be coming around. No, we're not talking about foolishness like that. We're talking about the promises of God. We're talking about our heart and our soul and our emotions and our spirit. We're tra talking about trying to walk in victory. The first time that a disciple spoke and the word rhema was used was on the day of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit filled the hearts of believers. And Peter stood up and he began to preach. And the Bible says that he said, Give heed to my words. And the word there was rhema. Peter was going to give an anointed, inspired word to his people, to the, to the people that were listening. And then that same, at the end of that message, the Bible tells us that 4,000 people were converted. It happened again in Acts chapter 10 when Peter again was speaking. While Peter yet spoke these words, that's rhema word, not logos word. While Peter yet spoke these anointed, inspired, truthful words from God's word, the Holy Spirit fell, and Cornelius and his household were all saved and baptized that very moment. So what we need to understand is that we need a word of faith in our life. A word of faith, a rhema word. We need to speak. A rhema word will inspire you. It will change you. It will give you peace it will change the way you think and you live. We don't, we need to, I, my, my son-in-law, John, is a music guy. He leads worship at his church. And I had a conversation with him a couple years ago. You see, I'm, I've been in my time, different, different periods of my time, I've been a news junkie. And I still listen to too much news. Really, it's not good for us. Because it's a whole bunch of logos, negative, critical. And don't you hate the TV commercials that are on right now? My goodness, why don't you just say something good about yourself instead of about everything bad about the, the opponent? I just kind of get tired of all of that stuff. Just hurry up, just pick someone and let's move on. I, I know it's really important. I don't mean to diminish election day, but I'm really tired of all that stuff. And the news, that's the headlines of every news. But my conversation with him, because he's, he's into music and worship music and God music. Insp that's Rama stuff, man. Worship inspires us. It lifts us. It builds us. And God's word is that way. We need to fill our life with less logos and more rhema. Less news, sports, weather, and entertainment and more of the inspired word of God, whether it's reading the word or listening to God's music, something that's going to that's gonna bless your heart and build your faith. Amen. Amen. All right. Praise God. So, let's think about some people in the scriptures. Abraham said to his son Isaac, My son, God, will provide a sacrifice. Abraham said it, and God did it. The three Hebrew children, before they were cast into the fiery furnace, said, Our God will deliver us, or can deliver us, out of the burning fiery furnace. They said it before the furnace. And God did it. David said before, standing before Goliath, he said, God will deliver me out of the hand. He said it. Do you get the, the trend here? David said, God will deliver me. The young boy against the mighty giant. And God did it. It happens over and over and over in the word of God. It's not an accident. It's not a, oh my Wow, I can't believe that's there. It should be an everyday living occurrence for us. Salvation alone is based on what we say. If we confess the Lord Jesus Christ and believe that God has raised him from the dead, we shall be saved. It's simple, but it is what we say. When Jesus was confronted by Satan in the wilderness, Jesus said, right, it is written, he said, Jesus fought the enemy with words. Rhema can be in our prayer. We don't want to just logos pray. We want to rhema pray. We want to pray with anointing and with authority. We want to profess and proclaim the word of God. That makes a difference. That changes our heart and it changes our lives when we speak with rhema, with power, and with faith in our hearts. You know, when we say grace, I wondered as I was 
thinking about this message, when we say grace, we kind of do a logos prayer, just the Lord, thank you for this food. And I don't think there's anything wrong with that. We are honoring and respecting God and we are thankful for what happened, but that may not be a logos, even though it's true, a logos is inspired. That's where, where you kind of get lost, or at least I visualize getting lost in the presence of God and in an intercession and boldly, boldly proclaim God's word and God's truth in times of difficulty. So let me talk about moving away from uh, the scriptural examples. You know, these lights, I'm always afraid I'm going to step off. It's kind of dark up here. And you, that's my perspective. You don't see that. But here, if you wonder why I'm looking around, it's like, I want to make sure there's a platform here I'm stepping out on. So the World Series just took place. The L.A. Dodgers lost to the Boston Red Sox. Some of you would know that and follow baseball. I don't follow baseball at all, uh, not even during the World Series. I know who wins. That's about the only game I could tell you about the entire year. I know the Indians didn't make it, and Boston beat the L.A. Dodgers. Last year, it was kind of interesting, though, last year's World Series, the L.A. Dodgers lost to somebody else. They lost to, does anybody know who won the World Series last year? Somebody knows that? In Ohio? I, I didn't think, I was kind of thinking maybe no one would have any idea. It's interesting about the Houston Astros because they had never won a World Series before. They had never even played in a World Series. And their franchise was began in 1962. That means they had 55 years of losing, excuse me, 55 years of not winning the championship. It's like, you know, I don't know who the owner of that franchise is, but he might want to sell it and open a fried chicken restaurant or something, you know, because you're not doing real good with the baseball thing here. Uh, just, just my thought as, you know, as I was following the news from a distance. And then I, it was last year also. Last year was an interesting year. Last year, the Philadelphia Eagles won the Super Bowl. They had never been to a Super Bowl or won a national championship in football and their franchise started, I looked it up because I was so curious about this. When somebody wins for the first time, it's like, how long have you been trying? How long have you been working at this? The Philadelphia Eagles started their franchise in 1933, 85 years of losing. Why don't you I just wonder what's going on? But you know what? There had to be a place in their life where they said, you know, we believe and we're going to keep on going, and we're going to keep on working. There, and there comes a place in your life when you're, you're confronted with the, the bold, ugly truths, like, man, I'm not very good at this, but if you believe in it and you work hard at it, you can overcome your obstacles, and I believe you can do almost anything. The Bible says anything, impossible. Nothing is impossible. I believe that people with sure ganas, ganas is a Spanish word, a Spanish word for desire, with sheer desire can do almost anything if they put their mind to it. And then when you put God's blessing upon it, man, there was a, there was a man that played for the, well, I won't tell you what professional team he played for, he was from Akron, I will in a moment, James Harrison, probably never heard of him. Well, James Harrison is kind of an interesting story. He grew up in Akron, Ryan, near you. He grew up in Akron. He was poor. He played football in Akron and, and then one of the suburban schools around Akron in high school. He was very good, but when he graduated from high school, no college team wanted him to play football. Nobody. And it was discouraging for him, but because he lived close to Kent State, real right down the street, not too far, I don't know why I didn't choose Akron Zips, but he, he went to Kent State and he talked to the coach there and said, look, I don't need a scholarship. I don't need any help. Just let me play on the team. I've got ability and it's my desire and that's what I want to do. And he was a Christian. And it was his dream to do this. Even though sometimes our, my kids and my grandkids have dreams and it seems like I'm thinking in my mind, oh, that's never going to happen. <laughs> Don't tell them that. Just let them dream. Let them dream. They'll, they'll find out later the reality and they might surprise you and accomplish things that you didn't think they could ever accomplish. So when you hear somebody, especially a young person who's just kind of talking, kind of seemingly wild with, with these big imaginary eyes, just let them dream. Don't, don't steal their dreams from them. James Harrison had a dream to play football for a living. Nobody wanted him in college. Nobody offered him a scholarship. So he played for nothing in college. 
He played for nothing. He was a walk-on at Kent State University. His freshman year, he didn't play a single bit during the games, but he practiced and he, he got better and bigger and faster and stronger. He played his sophomore, junior, and senior year at Kent State. So, man, I'm going to make it to the pros. I just know someone's going to draft me and I'm going to move on because I played for three years as a starter at a Kent State University. No teams in the pro NFL drafted him. Now, if you, I don't know how much you know about NFL. I, I follow a little bit more football, college mostly. There are 32 teams in the NFL, and when they do the draft, they draft one for each team. That's 32 picks, and there are 16 rounds in the draft. That's 512 players. So when they're done with the NFL draft, they've picked what they thought were the best 500 players in the whole country, and when they were all done picking people, nobody picked James Harrison. He had defeat in high school. He had defeat in college. Nobody believed in him, and yet he proved them wrong. And now he wants to play for the pros, and nobody believes in him again. But he's been there. He's been down that road. He understands. He was a Christian who had a dream, a dream that might seem like unbelievable, but it was his dream. And he was determined to do what he was going to do with his life. So he, having that no professional teams would have him as a player, and being in Akron, he decided to go to Pittsburgh, not to Cleveland. <laughs> if I could talk with him, I'd say, why didn't you go to Cleveland? Maybe he had bigger dreams than that. I, I don't know. So he drove to Pittsburgh and met with the coach there and said, look, man, I'll play for nothing. I'll play for, he became an undrafted free agent on the lowest possible salary you could have. And he started, and, and so he was signed up. He didn't start. He was signed up with the Pittsburgh Steelers. This young man had ability that just hadn't been discovered. The story of James Harrison goes on that he started for the next 13 years as a linebacker for the Pittsburgh Steelers. He was selected five times for the Pro Bowl selection, and he won two Super Bowl rings. He was chosen the NFL Defensive Player of the Year, the only undrafted player to ever reach that accomplishment. And we didn't even know who he was. He was a nobody to us. He was like in the book of Hebrews, and it says, and there were many others who were not mentioned here. He was one of those never mentions. Now, I'm not a Pittsburgh fan, so I never paid any attention to them, or else maybe if you're a Pittsburgh fan, you might have heard the name. You certainly should have. 13 years as a, as a starter and and a defensive player of the year. But he said this. What, I, I told you all that to get you to this point in his story. He said this. As a Christian, I pray every day as if everything in my life depends upon God. Part two. But I train and live every day as if everything in my life depends upon me. Wow. Pray like it depends on God and live like it depends on you. We first must believe. We first must believe. And then we will achieve. But if you don't believe, if you don't believe you're not going to the promised land, God says, you know, I love you. I'll still protect you. I'll rain manna from heaven. I'll take care of you. But if you don't believe you're going to the promised land, you're not gone. But if you believe and you act by faith on what you believe, the world is yours. Heaven and earth is for yours, for his glory. Nothing is impossible. Nothing is impossible. You know, we're talking about the promises of God this morning. And we all have, I don't know what your favorite promise is, you know, that you will have peace, with, peace beyond understanding, joy unspeakable. Let he that is weary come unto me and I will give him rest. There's so many promises in the word of God, promises of blessings pressed down, shaken together and running over. But my f personal favorite promise 
is it in Psalms, it says this, Jesus, not Jesus, but in God in the Old Testament in Psalms said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Wow. Even in tough times, even in difficulty, when it seems like there's no hope, where there's no end, you don't know what you're going to do, you don't know which way you're going to go, you're at that fork in the road, and, and both choices are ugly. God is with you. And even if you're not a believer, God's with you, waiting for you to recognize who he is. As, as a person that's not a believer, you must first come to God and believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. And then you simply confess Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior and receive him into your life. And then again, you, along with the rest of us, will have thousands of promises in your life. Not promises that are going to pay your bills, but promises that will walk you through the storm. It'll either remove the mountain or drill a hole through it or give you the, the energy and the strength to walk around it. You shall have what you say. Paul must have believed that must have been one of his favorite promises also because he was beaten and stoned and robbed and forsaken and shipwrecked and, and so many things happened to him, imprisoned and finally killed for what he believed. And Paul said in the book of Romans, I am persuaded that nothing shall separate me from the love of God. Nothing. Not life nor death, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any creature, nothing shall separate us from the love of God. So whatever you're going through this morning, I'd like for you to stand. Can we all stand together right now? And can we have the praise team get back up here? I'd like for us to, to end this message this morning with, I believe in miracles. And what I want you to understand this morning is no matter where you are, there are others of us that may have victory this morning and be doing really well and you feel like, man, what's wrong with me? We've been there. There's not a person in here who hasn't gone through devastating failure at some point in your life. Disappointments who haven't been picked on or tormented or lost or been fired or, or had to file bankruptcy or just seemed like everything was hopeless and impossible for them. Every single one of us have experienced things like that in our lives. And we stand here this morning in the presence of God, hearing a rhema word that with God, all things are possible. A rhema word that says, he will never leave you nor forsake you. A rhema word that says, you shall have whatsoever you say. And for our prayer following this message, I, I thought about having people come up, but this is really a universal call. So I'm just going to have you stay where you are. But as the praise team gets ready and as they lead this song in worship, I encourage you to proclaim the word of God in your life, to profess a promise that's in God's word that you know is true and stand upon it and believe it and trust God for the victory in your life because he is the God of miracles. I believe, I believe in the God of miracles.